Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. And it is a Friday evening again. It's 8.50 on the nose. And here we are for Book Club. Book Club Session 6. Oh, and here's Timothy Gordon. Timothy, what's going on, Daddy-O? What's up? What's up, Frankel? How hey, are you, man? I I'm doing great. How is the new addition to the family? How is everybody feeling? How's mom? Everyone's great. <clears throat> Mom's already up. Uh, Steph is already up. After the C-section, you know, they say it'll take two weeks. She, she was up like the third day and uh, nursing that scar, but we're good, man. Be oh, yeah. Beautiful. Life is good. God she, is good. She, she's, she's already back to doing planks and all that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'll, take, that'll take Hold a little up. while before she gets back to medicine ball work. Yeah, that'll take a right. little while, <laughs> but that's okay. so great. We, we held it down uh, best we could without you last week. But um, we, you were you were in all of our hearts and minds, so we're glad that everything worked out wonderfully. Thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah. How was it last week? Fun? A lot of fun. I, I, this book is continuing to get the action is starting to rise and rise and rise. And what we have here tonight, I have a, a bunch of notes. And because, like, I, I don't know, I have whoever inherits this book after me. There is just so it's so much underlined and highlighted, yellow highlighter, pink highlighter, pen. It's just uh, d dog eared, doggy eared uh, pages. It's um, there's just something on every page that's amazing. And um, I, I guess what I would say is that the big theme I try to say the big overarching theme for this this grouping of, of chapters for me was getting the United States mission that dual mission in the united states underway gladstone and father slattery they are they are i mean it's just been insane uh what are your general thoughts yeah it's cool i mean you, you the two weeks ago you were talking about the dream team or, or whatever the little the small cadre of, of good guys and it was going to be Gladstone and Slattery, and we thought um, in, in maybe maybe working closer connection, uh, Father Gutmacher. So it's cool to see them getting their assignments. I'm probably behind. I don't know what page you guys went to. I'm probably behind you, but um, I got through the first part of where I know you started up this week, and it, it was cool to see this um, this expression that uh, the, the human condition is intimately bound. Or what does he say it is? It's like kryptonite, uh, homosexuality and Satanism. And so they're both going in like, uh, you know, task busters on an elite uh, inside, you know, corrupt police force to do what they had to do. It's it's exciting. Yes. Uh, so at what point, uh, just so I know, I, obviously I'll probably be catching you up big time tonight, but what I, what uh, we read to page 439. That's okay. Yeah, I got I got to about I, I mean I'm kind of I've got a couple threads going because I got behind the last two weeks, uh, but except so I read I read a big swath of the where I knew the the reading would begin tonight, and then I'm going back and I'm key, so I have two dog-eared pages going out. So okay, so then let yeah. let me just take this in chronological order then because I have plenty of notes here. Page 375, we start out. Yeah, and it opens up with the Slavic Pope considering his next moves going forward, and he decides very curiously, um, and it's throwing everybody for a loop. He decides to go headfirst into the superficial stance of globalism. Uh, he had Cardinal Mastroianni pen this address to the UN. It's called the negotiations, and in it, Mastroianni was at least genuflecting and using some traditionally Catholic phrases and just you know playing the part. Um, where, uh, but then, you know, thinking that he was going to get, you know, he was probably going to get, uh, even more traditional edits coming from the Pope. Right. The Slavic Pope does the exact opposite. He intentionally edits out all references to anything that could be identifiably Catholic, uh, uh any reference to Christ, any reference to the universal church and replaces it all with very secular hippie come together nonsense. And on page 376, this uh, this move we start seeing casts a layer of confusion over the entire segment that we had to uh, that we had to read a layer of confusion for everybody the satanic elite as you see on page 377 they are really confused but they consider it a net positive that he is 
you know, he's coming to their side. And then, of course, you have the members of the Pope's inner circle, the loyal inner circle. They, one by one, as they see this this uh, printed note, start expressing their dismay as far as what is he doing? Right. You know, um, so so that's that's the real big opening there. And the publishing of that address to the U.N. called the negotiations has a different impact on everybody, including Apple Yard. It's wondering what the hell is going on. Why this shift? Yeah, it's great. G- genius move. Uh, I, I thought because I hadn't I, I started reading on 375 and I, you know, was part of my catch up project for the next week. Um, I'm like, oh, they must know. I was assuming that uh, our, our, our two heroes know what the hell uh, JP2 is doing here. You know, that, that, that obviously this was meant to throw off uh, Dr. Channing and, of course, uh, Ben Thoke and, and maybe Paul Gladstone and their company. But I, it, was, it was funny to see that, that Christian and Slattery were just as confused. Yes. Yes. Um, here, here's a little, a little piece of that. Uh, hold on a second. Um, Given Brother Augustine's persuasive evidence of ritualistic Satanism and murder among the clergy, it didn't take a genius to figure out that a uh, a sinister and vicious force had penetrated at least one important sector of the hierarchy of the church and had linked that hierarchy to a most baleful way to the secular uh, secular secularization and paganization under a way among the nations. That's when we have this this line here. The Pope had no choice for the moment but to press his policies to a new level. He would sanctify the activities of mankind by his active presence among them. He would raise his public profile still further. In circumstances that would have eliminated other Popes, he would maintain active in the affairs of mankind and would emphasize those things that unite peoples, Catholic and non-Catholic, for all the religion was facing for all, religion was facing the same threat of liquidation. He would redouble his efforts to carry the grace of God with him as Pope while, te- while talking in the language of the world. So that's where, that's where he started, and that's where he endeavors to go off. I think that there's really interesting things about taking sides in local skirmishes. They talk about Yugoslavia in here and the way that it is always... Uh, pinned up it looks exactly like the what we're seeing right now with uh, NATO versus Russia and Ukraine um, and then and then like I said before you have Mesriani he's like what the hell is he doing I'm confused by this and it actually perturbs him a little bit now while that's going on Tim we got the American mission is well underway and they're all and every bit of what's going on here between I, I, at least I believe it Father Christian Gladstone and Father Damien, are they are preparing as if they're spies. And I love the preparation there, the strate- learning, reminding each other about being strategically conspicuous so you can't be framed for one thing or another, the do's and don'ts as they go into this, this uh, mission here. Yeah, over tip, under tip. Yes. Be exceptionally rude or exceptionally polite, something to be remembered by. It's, it's, it's amazing because yeah. I start thinking that they know how dire this mission is, and then they go their separate ways. Damien Slattery is going to Chicago to meet with Detective Wagdilla, who was familiar with the Scalabrini murder, and they were going to uh, and they were going to be you know going deep in on the Satanism aspect. Christian is going down to interview this Father O'Reilly who has uh, nearly been defrocked at this point because of his continued attempts to expose rampant homosexuality in the priesthood. And it's made very clear how dangerous it is to to poke this bear, this 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 homo satanic bear. I don't know how else to describe it, but um, it, it is two sides of the same coin in this uh, in this mission here. And uh, this is a real thing that they do, by the way, Frank, is the... Um the psychosexual treatment they send them to a place in minnesota uh which was which was cast also in father elijah this is real this uh re-education camp that they send whistleblowers on the uh pedo homo uh satanic uh i don't know nefarious actors so i i've had two friend two priests who are my personal friends that have gone through this and basically had their uh sacerdotal careers their clerical careers completely derailed by uh blowing the whistle and then being sent to minnesota so it's real it's absolutely real like 
95% of the rest of this book, I'm afraid. You know, and and then, of course, last week, I think one of the things I asked while I was on, because I got confused, I didn't know if it had happened already, we were talking about, I think the last time that you were on before you had the baby break was Ceci goes before the, the, the IRA, the, ch- the, uh, the church bank, and is... Before she signs over a loan to once again bail the bank out of, you know, some some kind of sticky problems that they have over there, she says, you know what, I would really like an audience with the Pope. And last week I was asking, I didn't know if that meeting had happened or not. I, I didn't remember it. It happened now. And she finally gets her meeting with the Slavic Pope, and she is a bull in this meeting. She wants him to, she, she takes no shit. She gives no quarter, but she's very polite, but she's very stern. She's really, she commanded a lot of respect of everybody in that meeting. But she ultimately asks the, uh, the Pope to create somewhat of a safe place for all ostracized priests, like you're talking about right here, it's priests that are, are being pushed out. And, uh, and, and uh, she says she even provided a list of all priests that she had personally vetted that uh, that she wants to be able to, I guess, bring nearer to Windswept House and create almost like a haven for more traditional uh, practicing of the faith. And that's, uh, that's I forget how that meeting concludes, but very, very curious of what her angle was. Well, I think it was inconclusive, right? Yeah. From kind of context clues, uh, it's inconclusive. Uh, this is... A real problem. A real problem in in the church today are good guy priests being bullied into submission, and uh, there have been several people that, like um, Sessi, have attempted to be patriarchal, matriarchal figures to them, especially financially, to to, to create just such a thing. They they, they touch on it with SSPX. Can I go back um, a second? What I also wanted to say that I think is interesting about Christian is remember from the first 150 pages, he has a similar confusion, distinction of degree, not kind, a smaller but similar confusion to the motives of trying to um, abstract what the motives of JP2 are in all of his quasi-ecumenism. You know, and then even even Paul Gladstone, his brother, in a later time when he's talking to Benthoke is like, JP2 is part traditional, but partly, you know, a, a pope of the new order, which is what most people think about him. Um, I think this only adds to the profundity of, of Christian's impression that, that JP2, this, uh, this opening scene where, where JP2 keeps in the super new age language. I think it, it confuses Christian before. Remember when he's talking to Carnesecca and he's like, maybe I've judged him too harshly, but, um, you know, why does he go along with the program so much? It turns out we, the reader, get the view that, like, oh, here's why. He's, he's yeah, he's the he's the vicar of Christ on earth. He's, he's the head honcho, but all of his lieutenants are against him, and there's a lot of power there in I'm, all of the lieutenants being against you. So he's, he's getting... At the same time that he's getting a, a sort of close-up, microscopic, granular view of, you know, an answer to his original question, why does the Pope struggle with pushing back? Now, in a more profound way, he probably could be thinking, how as he was thinking in the first hundred pages, whereas he kind of redacted his point of view after he talked to Carnesecca. Now, uh, to complement that in particular how you how we can see that Christian Gladstone does not um does not pull any punches with his uh, his analysis of the Slavic Pope John Paul II's behavior how he he's why does he allow all this to happen on his watch and 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 what are all these mixed messages here so he he's not completely settled on where he's coming from Absolutely, but the, here's the other thing that makes it uh, makes me scratch my head. On page 393, we are as the readers at the bottom here. He was just talking with um, with uh, Damien Slattery again a little bit there. So this is right after Sessa. Sessi does her thing um, at the at the Vatican. Then we go back to Christian Gladstone, and he says this. In general, Christian had a very positive attitude toward his to his missions. His two missions in the United States, of course, one is the mission for Masteriani to keep um, to keep, you know, pretty much canvassing unity in the church and all that stuff. But the second mission is hush hush 
for the Pope to work alongside in different places. Because obviously we know that the um, his digging into homosexual priests goes hand in hand with the digging into satanic ritual. Um, even though he and Slattery are in different parts of the country. But still... Let's look at this at the very bottom of the page. In general, Christian had a very positive attitude toward his two missions in the United States. For all of his respect for Damien Slattery, he still wouldn't buy the idea that his work for Mastroianni in the United States was somehow designed to make trouble for the Slavic Pope. So whereas he is very honest about... Um, uh, and, and very, it's very easy for him to see this kind of like a... a uh, maybe like a, a superficial duality for the Slavic Pope where he says one thing, he acts another way, he's very contradictory at times. At the same time, he's, he can't buy into the fact that Mastroianni is, is, is a, a pure bad guy. Like he's like a, he's a dark side guy. He can't, right. he can't get on that. So I don't understand why he's still blind to Mastroianni's dark side activity. Right, right. Yeah, which is weird because he had such a strong initial impression to Mastroianni. So that, that, that caught me off guard. Yeah. He seems so... Remember, when they first meet around page, I don't know, 200, um, 175 or something, Mastroianni thinks so little of him. And he, conversely, thinks so little of Mastroianni. And he's like, oh, I know exactly what... what this guy thinks of me. He thinks I'm a simple Anglo Sassone and I look you right in the eye and I'm, I'm just a, a farm boy or whatever from the middle of the United States. So yeah, I remember you, Frank, being really impressed with, it. I was impressed with it as I read it too. It's like, Oh, he's really sharp yeah, because it goes through this third person omniscient narration gives you the chance to hear Mastroianni's thoughts. And then you go to hearing Christian's thoughts, and, and he's mapped out precisely what Mastroianni thinks about him. So he's may, called it. So then maybe maybe it's a little bit where he, maybe he's still stuck with Mastroianni in a way where he sees him as almost like a very uh, stiff corporate suit um, who also has a little bit, to, who, who suffers from a little bit of elitism as well, but still has not taken that leap into this guy it has a major hand in a satanic plot to destroy the church and of course bring in a new world order by assimilating all of these gigantic um epicenters of global power whether it be faith or economics or whatever i, I he can't see that so i guess right now he's just looking at him as like a corporate stiff pretty much C so can i ask you a question sure i, I it's a, sort of a clarification question but it's been on my mind the whole time. And this might be because there's a hole and I, I skipped about 90 pages before uh, this last week's reading, but, and I'm gonna catch up on all that. But so do we have proof positive, we the reader, that Mastroianni is actually involved in the Vatican Satanism? Or like, I know he's friends with Benthoke and Benthoke tells him we just we just initiated Paul into the Masons and things like that, but where it, it, it seems like Malachi and Martin is leaving us to guess a little bit on that point. But yeah, maybe it, I just it's not my it's not very. I think it's just um, right now it's been more so of a guilt by association thing, right. where you have to imagine what is it what is really in it for him if he's not working working toward and and, and we have gotten that as much. We have gotten that much from him. He's working to to um, to further the process, and all the people that he has come in contact the the, the telephone uh, meetings and everything else. I mean, they know that this is heresy. They know that this is apostasy. They understand what's going on here, but and they know that all of their friends and some of their closest allies. I mean, they know exactly who the Cardinal of Century City is and what he's up to. They know about everything. Um, uh, with in that respect, uh, like Orentini, who is under in, is working side by side with Mastroianni as well. They're trying to get rid of Carnesecca because they believe that he has uh, been privy to the documentation about the enthronement uh, uh, ritual back in 1963. So they are trying to tie up loose ends to protect the reality of the the very real satanic. Um, overtures that are going throughout all this so yeah we haven't had we haven't like caught him red-handed doing anything right really right. devious but 
I mean, they're all working to the same end. It, it can't be any other way. Yeah. Um, I, I, yep. n- now, here's where things get crazy. Here's where things get crazy. Around 400, page 400, Father Slattery and Detective Wagdilla, they get started, and they come out right with it. Here is um, here is Slattery showing up to Wagdilla's place on their first day of work. Uh <clears throat> On his own while, uh, on his own while his wife was off visiting her cousins in New York, the retired police inspector Sylvester Wagdilla put his coffee on, took the makings of a splendid breakfast from the refrigerator, and had just begun changing about uh, among the pots and pans in the kitchen of his two-story wooden frame house in Holland section of Century City, when the door chimes rang. What kind of uncivilized oaf, Wagdilla wondered, would disturb a peace-loving man in the crack of dawn? And then all of a sudden you hear, good morning to you, Inspector Wagdilla. I am Father Damien Duncan Slattery, fresh in from Rome. I've come to nose out the trail of clerical Satanists. And I, what a way to, to, to be greeted at the door. That is just, I, I knew that this was just going to be awesome, and it never stopped kicking ass after that. Yeah. Um, they go after, I mean, it, it jumps over from there to, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, I forget. To, oh, oh, no. Around, around the, that's where we, we learned that the Scalabrini murder in the beginning of the book. He, that Scalabrini had turned into a confidential informant for the police. And that he was killed by this father, George Connolly, who was also killed shortly after that. All of them uh, taken care of in the same ritual way. The fingers cut off, the genitals stuffed in the mouth, the, uh, the certain amount of stab wounds correlating with how old they were. And then you have Slattery and Wagdilla. They go down to track down this guy. His name is Father Oswald Avonador. And it is awesome. They show up at this hotel where Oswald is. And he's presented the way that they show up, very menacing. It's like a good cop, bad cop kind of situation. And he's, they present this Father Oswald Avonador with death photos of the murdered priests. As well as pictures of Father Oswald, of him at a gay marriage that the Cardinal of Century City had attended as well. So they're just showing him, we know who you are, we know what's going on, and we want to know who killed these priests. And, and because the main thing that they're trying to do is find the Mother Chapel. They want to know where the hell the Mother Chapel is. And this all comes boiling out at page in page 406. And let me see where the hell we at here. 406 is the first page where I am reading, and I went, Wow. There's a couple of wow pages in this. And here it is. Um, they're, they're confronting Ivanador here. And he says, his voice was still uh, still a tortured whisper. Father Oswald obeyed. Willowship, Harding, and Roan Tree were the places. Those are the three different places where they knew that there were satanic covens that had a high level of activity. Uh, in each case, the pastor was the organizer, Lotzinger, Carolee, and Tompkins. He rasped the name of each of them. So those are the organizers of the of the uh, the covens. Uh, and Slattery asks, and all three are pedophiles. There was only a slight change in his demeanor, but it was Slattery, the exorcist, who was questioning the younger priest now, because he knows. I, this is where we get a glimpse of the old exorcist at work, Tim. And right. it is right. he he knows that there it's living in this guy, and he's going to draw it out just like anything else. Uh, the gr- a grotesque smile deformed uh, uh, deformed Avan- uh, Avanador's mouth. And he, rep- he said this, Little boys are always the guests of honor, Father Slattery. I'd have thought you knew that. And are any of these covens the Mother Chapel? No. Have you been to the Mother Chapel? Yes. Do you know the founder? Yes. Where is the Mother Chapel of Father Oswald? North, south, east, west, Avonador's voice took on a silky, sing-song quality. His misshapen smile turned to a toothy grimace. Slattery bent forward. He knew the signs. He didn't want to lose Avonador. He knew the signs. The, 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 the demon was coming to the surface. Right. Now, yeah. when I was reading this little exchange right here, I was remembering Malachi Martin's appearances on Art Bell, where he was talking about the demeanor you bring into an exorcist, where you, you, you never, you're not asking questions, you're not interacting, you are monotone, you are, you are talking directly and commanding. You're asking, you want the, the, question, the an- questions answered, and that's it. And I can see that kind of demeanor coming out here. And of course, the author knows exactly how that's done. And he says here, 
Uh, Slattery bent forward. Uh, he knew the signs. He didn't want to lose Ivanador. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, tell me where to find the Mother Chapel. And that is when Avonador's eyes were glazed and bulging, and he starts slipping into this, this, this weird fucked up trance. His mouth opens, and he says the words, A virgin lives in the highways of virginity. A virgin, a virgin virgins in the byways of virginity. And they go on, and this pretty much is a, uh, an exceedingly dark, dark time that they're talking off there as he was pretty much in the middle of an exorcism or at least a, an inquisition with a demon. And hell, man, that's the first time I said, wow. Oh, the action is getting real deep. Yeah, 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 that's good stuff. That's good stuff. I mean, <clears throat> the, I, I just want to remind people, I, I guess I, I see some, this is something in my role. You can go learn about uh, the, the Archdiocese or the Holy See of, of Century City, which is uh, Cardinal Bernadine's uh, all the stuff on Bernadine is real. And he, I was excited about a hundred pages earlier. I started getting really excited when, with a lot of tabletop discussions with interesting themes, I started getting real excited when Bernadine or whatever, well, Leonard in is what he's called in the, uh, the, the book, more often just the, the arch, uh, Bishop of century city. Mm -hmm. When he became like the the focal point of as an American antagonist, so that because I know so much about Bernard and people should go look him up. He's all the stuff is true, uh, homosexualist, uh, you know, pedophiliac, uh, presumptively a pedophiliac uh, Satanist, tons and tons of smoking gun type evidence, and uh, yeah. So it just makes me wonder, Frank. What portion of this book is not fact? I mean, as I as the more, the more we get into Oratini, who's the um, Silvestrini in real life, and I know a fair amount about that particular prelate, but but most especially about Bernadine, I'm like, oh wow, this is all syncing up with what I know, and I'm like, is this ninety five five, you know? fact fiction or like 991 is there any fiction in this at all I'm thinking I, I'm thinking the only place where you might be able to call this fiction at this point and I know way less than you do and I, I'm, I'm just following along and just trying to juxtapose what we're seeing mapped out and plotted here to what we're living through right now I would have to imagine that the if it is 95 5 then the 5% is is solely where he is creating dialogue between people, dialogue between the, uh, the, the this this coven of this council of thirteen and these <laughs> globalists, he, he where he has to just kind of imagine the kinds of meetings that were being taken place. Maybe he has a little bit of an inside track into some of those meetings and and whatever. And, and but you have to take some kind of uh, some kind of uh, liberties with creating the dialogue maybe that's just where it is where yeah right. these events happened i don't know exactly what each person said in the room but obviously it culminated with this action so that has to be it because everything else is this is this is almost like a, a manual to how the world has become 30 years later yeah exactly and on that note i just i got some more detail in my my reading that i've been catching up on the last week on uh ratzinger I forget the the character's name. I wouldn't even know how to uh, pronounce it. <laughs> the way the, the Ratzinger character, Pope Benedict. Mm. I'm glad to have seen him enter into the action. A lot of these guys, I've just been waiting for them to be in the action, and I can't tell you, Frank, how many aha moments I've had over the last couple readings where I'm like, now that more of the characters are coming into it, this is so strange that this was written in 1996 because. The central plot, remember, of the, the inter-church, intra-church Satanists is just to secure the abdication of JP2. And although he's a minor character in this, um, their connection is played down, JP2 and, and Ratzinger, who became Benedict, it's weird that he didn't end up retiring. He, he held to the office through all of the... Um, the Parkinson's, which is not mentioned in this book at all. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't cover the Parkinson's disease at all. JP2 was in a decline throughout all of the latter half of the 90s and the early 2000s. And Ratzinger, uh, whatever he's called in the book, I can read you the name from my little character key here. 
he was on the ascent, not not in a nefarious way, but he was Ratzinger's right hand man. He was uh, number two in terms of doctrine, the CDF, and so it's weird to me. It's just I, I know I said this before, but now that I've seen some dialogue from all parties, it's just crazy that he wrote this in 1996 about a plot to get JP two to abdicate the throne for the first time in eight centuries, the, the, the papal throne. And it ended up happening to the continuation, the Gemini twin of JP2 uh, pontifically. Uh, and it was it was done by a lot of the same characters that are characterized in the book, like Aretini and and the, the Daniil's character, the Sogd Golan Mafia. So there, there was something going on that I didn't know about. If this is fact fiction, this is all I'm saying. This came out of my reading, so I'm I'm not trying to sidetrack you. But, no, it's not sidetrack. Uh, well, let me ask I, you a question on that. It, so then, would this make it? Would the, would his in the opening of these segments that we are reading in this past week? Would the Slavic Pope JP II's um, uh, committing himself to a course of action that at least superficially embraces the globalist secularist cause? Um, is that what allowed him the leeway to live as long as he did and die naturally? Because it, it's, uh, it, it seems like he, he played along and they kind of backed off on the resignation thing, but they got it with his, his predecessor or his uh, successor. Right, right, exactly. Or, or maybe he was JP2 was a little tougher than I always assumed. But my, just so people out there know, What's on record, Daniels, one of the, the Sankt Gallen Mafia characters who's characterized in this book, um, what he says is that they met the Sankt Gallen Mafia from 1996 to 2005. Those were the last 10 years of JP2's pontificate. And it's a group like any of these tabletop discussions. It's one of these groups that, that is being described, one of these tabletop discussions that's being described with several of the characters. I think I counted them, five of the Gallen members. Um, and so from 1996 to 2005, though, in reality, what we know by admission is that these guys were plotting to avoid a Ratzinger papacy. And it was a presumptive thing because he was the right hand man to JP2 and was running everything doctrinally for those last 10 years. And of course they didn't know when he was finally going to succumb to the Parkinson's. Right. But so in reality, what, what, if this is really fact fiction, then all this does is it deepens my understanding of the Gallen group. And I'm like, Oh, they're probably meeting before 1996. And in maybe until 1996, they were just trying to secure the uh, resignation of JP2 and yeah. then in 96 they might have changed the name I there was a name change they were meeting beforehand um that's a fact but then they might have changed the goal of the outfit it it seems evident to okay uh you know JP2 might stand down maybe he's succumbed more to the the rhetoric of new world order stuff and he's always been a little bit more of an ecumenist um universalist quasi universalist than than Ratzinger so let's just focus on avoiding the Ratzinger pontificate. We can kind of do what we want under declining JP2 anyway. The book doesn't capture that, how fast he was declining. I don't even think they captured that he had Parkinson's. So that's that's where it's opening a lot of doors in my mind. Yeah. I I, I mean, and, and just learning this as I go, I it's uh, I'm I'm having a real uh, fun time seeing the pieces get put together. Um, and, and then and then you know, here's the other thing you talk about the path that the world is on and that the, that these characters are setting the uh the church on but also just whatever they do to the church they're just setting people up to be sucked into the whirlpool that is this UN agenda 2030 new world order thing and we get back to christian and pay on chapter 37 and this is where we start getting it's an incredible chapter in itself it wasn't high action in chapter 37 this is where um, he goes. He's talking a little bit to that uh, O'Reilly, the uh, the father Mike O'Reilly, who was pretty much being ostracized for for continuing to um, investigate just how bad the homosexuality problem is among the the priests. Uh, but from there, he goes and spends a little time. We meet this Bishop James McGregor, who used to spend apparently a lot of time at windswept house during Christian's youth. 
and he lays down some unbelievable truths about about the way the world is and the, this occult system. And when I say occult, I don't even really mean ritual. I'm talking about the the, the dictionary definition of occult, which is a hidden world, you know, a whole hidden world and how this system works. For example, on page 407, we have this. Gladstone began, Gladstone began to understand the workings of what O'Reilly had called a mutually protective system, reaching all the way from O'Cleary's Chancery right up to the College of Cord- Cardinals, a, a protective system. Then on page 410, we have a little bit here. This is from McGregor. It says, look, Christian. McGregor poked at the soil here and there as the pair strolled toward the, fa- the farther end of the garden. If it's corruption of the faith you're trying to understand, the first lesson to master is the corrosive effect of self-protection. A majority of the bishops are good in the ordinary sense of the word. Like a, a lot of other decent men, all they want is to keep their jobs and get ahead. Their corruption lies in the fact that they don't raise their voices against the corruption around them. They're corrupt in the sense that they let the church decay while their parishioners bleat like lambs being led to the slaughter by the dogs. Then he goes into... On page 411, it gets even crazier about how he even describes what we're living through right now with artificially intelligent echo chambers online and how we're getting beaten with all these market-tested words and and things like that. Listen to this. Uh, You've come here for truth, Chris. McGregor turned uh, turned from his files at last. And for my money, the truth is that life and thought, is that, is that life and thought and faith itself are being digitalized. We are all bar- barreling down the same info bond the way gold grubbers thronged to Sutter's Mill. But gold isn't the big attraction now. Even the best bishops I know are being enticed down that highway by one word that sparkles and gleams at every turn, digital. More and more the information we rely on run to uh, uh, we rely on to run our diocese uh, and our parishes comes from a computer network that fuses everything into one mode. Religion and the morality based on that religion are being reduced to endless streams of zeros and ones, and something in that process, or maybe something about the way it's being used, is stripping supernatural meaning away from the facts, uh, uh, the facts that um, the facts the way our good Kansas corn is stripped from the cobs. And then he goes down here to say he says. Um, um, you know, Christian starts, he, he says, okay, but maybe it's not that bad. But he says, maybe you're right, McGregor says, but the same watchwords keep cropping up in every conversation I have these days with my brother bishops, and they all come out of this new creed. Like what, for instance, Christian asks. McGregor reeled off a miniature lexicon that left Christian glassy-eyed. Ecumenical resurgence, social renewal, gender equality, biblical computer uh, computeracy, uh, social facilitators, catechiz- uh, catech- uh, catechetical facilitators, liturgical facilitators, pro- uh, programmatic pastoral development, task forces, ministry teams, problem solving, communal healing, enculturation, horizontal prayer. Uh, I don't know what the horizontal prayer is. Uh, outcome. That means, that means uh, priesthood of all believers. You know, the the the, the lay leading the priests in prayer. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. the, he, he goes more. He goes outcome based education. This is all stuff that we deal with today. Virtual yeah. reality, collaborative uh, ministry, uh, concept of giftedness, stra- strategic planning, and that's the digital vocabulary of faith in America now, my young friend. McGregor ignored the intercom that buzzed behind him in the back. It's a vocabulary that looked sophisticated, but in reality, it's primitive beyond belief. It's a vocabulary that deals only in material images, and there are no material images that can express the non-material dimension of life. The more that you think in these terms, the less able you are to think in terms of the supernatural as the fundamental basis of everything. Indeed, it becomes impossible to think in terms of supernatural reality at all. If words are reduced to nothing more than images, and if everything is made material, how is it possible to think in terms of the love of God, whom no man has seen? How is it possible to think about the incarnation, sacrifice, resurrection, and ascension of the Son of that God? No, Chris, in this new vocabulary of faith, the whole thing begins to slip away from us and drift off into cyberspace. I, that's just incredible. Incredible. Yeah, incredibly prescient. I mean, that was when we were still, you and I were still trying to dial up America Online from our, our you know, 
telephone wires yep. that he's he's writing this in 1996. So it's it's real. It's not even prescient. It's just he wrote this from a higher echelon of society, and uh, I don't. They were more digitized earlier or something. But that is incredible stuff. I, I thought the same thing. Here, there's more. This this I, I put this aside here too because it reminded me of the bullshit I just heard on the View uh, last last week. It was it was after Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi was was banned from receiving communion in San Francisco. Of course, she yeah. did it anyway in D.C. But when it happened, the hags on The View, they sat around and they, they started discussing with each other what the true meaning of communion was. Of course, they didn't say anything about Christ. They're talking about how communion was a way for people to connect with each other. Right. It, you know, it's a community thing. Like I, I said, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. But listen to this. Here's, uh, here is... Um, McGregor again. He says, you know yourself that even the real presence of Christ in the sacrament is fast falling out of the day-to-day -day creed. An immaculately, immaculately conceived virgin is a problem. Angels and saints are downright embarrassment. The infallibility of the infallible authority of the Pope is intolerable. Heaven itself, the idea that we can participate in the life of a God no man has seen, is treated as cultural myth. It's okay to study hell and purgatory in comparative cultural courses, but it's not practical to live your life, including your sexual life, as though they mattered, as though sin were as real as, say, virtual reality. And we, we've been given that subjectivity, Tim. It's... Um, it, it, it has permeated everything, and listening to those 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 completely empty skulled women on the View try to uh, go back and forth about what communion is and what church life is all about was just like ugh. I felt I felt like I was watching pigs throw up. I, I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. Well, look, we philosophers have a term for that. What you saw the the pig vomit by the the wretched harpy hags on the view was frank the instantiation of this masonic worldview this masonic enculturation incorporation of christianity into its its uh universal religion right where they're like yeah yeah, yeah eucharist communion okay they, they remove the christian truth from it and they just steer it slightly into a different direction that's what tolerance is it's christianity that's what uh, women's right to choose their husband was first Christianity. So then, then you go off in the direction of women's rights. They take Christ out. They take the cross out, and they universalize it. And it's called uh, religious syncretism, the big, the big Masonic movement. That's what this book is really all about. And you saw it up there on The View, and I saw that too, by the way. Yeah. Can I can – I, you know what's really phenomenal is um, the facilitation was one of these buzzwords in particular – and uh, around the middle 200, way earlier in the book, when uh, Cardinal Maestroani is talking to Pensa Bene, who's a very important, very high up character, they're talking about the facilitators, the facilitators and the liturgical and the uh, pastoral facilitators. You just mentioned the word again. They talk about what uh, this, this is probably my favorite quote in the book. Can I just read it real fast? Please, of it's course. Way, Way back on two page, page 251, my dear young friend, he cocked his sunken eyes toward Oratini, who's Silvestrini, Sankt Gallen Silvestrini. In my happy experience, it is one of the wonders of the human condition that with a little care and attention, almost anyone can be made to feel isolated and vulnerable, which this is a higher up, you know, one, one of the princes of Christ. He's saying that it's, it's lovely that anyone can be made uh, to feel isolated. When we plan the huge changeover in the daily mass going habits of 50, I mean, this is just reality. There's no faction here. This is just fact. When we plan the huge changeover in the daily mass going habits of 55 million Catholics in the United States, for example, we were not working in the 1920s, talking about Hitler and, and Mussolini, but in the 1970s after the council. Uh, and when we undertook to transform parish life and the importance of piety, we were not working in the 1930s, but in the 1980s when you and I were growing up, you know, being narcotized to, to the realities of, of real piety. And in both cases, we would have gotten nowhere without change agents and facilitators. Just think, Eminence, think. Pensabene tapped his bony temple with a bony finger. Ask yourself, how did it happen in the United States 
than the short space of two decades, the 70s and the 80s, the two decades following the council. We practically obliterated any effective traces of a liturgy and parish life that had been ingrained, institutionally ingrained, he's talking about in America specifically, for nearly two centuries in the world. It happened in Europe too. In Europe, it was for two millennia. Yeah. I mean, this is fact, my friend. This is what made me into an agnostic for, you know, over half my life, almost half my life now. So that's those are those buzzwords you're talking about. Absolutely. I, point that out. I have that earmarked and I, I wanted to read that at some point. I realize it's passe now, but no, 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 it's all it's all listen, this 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 uh, book is becoming dictionary. You have to go back to certain things that I mean, we have to tie things together. Things are going to make uh, um, uh, they're going to make different appearances again. For example, uh, the avail- uh, the appearance once again of this enthronement that the fact that there is some sort of potency to the ritual that is running out they actually name it they call it they be- they have been referring to it as the availing time and they they capitalize it too a and t uh, I think it was I think it was capstone toward the end says I I remind you all that the availing time is running short but let's just get through this because I want to get into the 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 thread and then we'll wrap up because this is but this was so much dense there's so much stuff that was going on in this and the action is picked up so there's a lot here um back to slattery we go slattery and the detective wagdilla they are hunting down everyone they can at this point now they're scooping up every dark side priest they can find uh, to try to find out where the hell the mother chapel is and along the way we get this fantastic tidbits about correlation between satanic possession and military grade mind control and how Sl- Slattery and Wagdilla, they leave this possessed father, Avonador, with a psychiatrist friend of theirs that, that promised to keep him safe because he's going to be a witness. And the section ends like this on page uh, 418. He says, uh, let me see here. So, Sylvester, uh, you'll be keeping Avonador here, I take it. Life could be dangerous for him otherwise. That's, um, that's Slattery. So Sylvester told me, a sympathetic Dr. Paley accompanied, uh, accompanied Slattery as far as the hospital elevator. In a case as complex as this, I think it may be a long time before we ever get anything sorted out with Avonador. And then not entirely as a joke. Dr. Paley said, we might even need an exorcist before we're through. Let me know if you ever need a job, Father Damien. I just love that. Yeah. We may need an exorcist before that's all through. Now, Now they look... And now here, just to skip ahead a little bit to, to start wrapping this up a little, is they find the mother load. Wagdilla, the detective, and Father Slattery, they think to look for any bishops who may have been transferred out of Century City area over the years, and they find this Bishop Rusatan, a.k.a. Bishop Leo, from the enthronement scene in the, in the beginning. And just so happens he died at his, his, uh, his estate in Virginia within the last 24 hours of this inquiry. So um, he has everything. That's what they find. They go out there to this place in Virginia. That's where they start thinking that the that the whole thing about virgins and virginity may have been a um, almost like a mind control cover up kind of a uh, a coping mechanism or a patch job for that um, that Avonador character, so that he wouldn't give up the goods under interrogation or under exorcism. And they said, well, let's go to Virginia. And they found that there was unbelievably detailed files for decades worth of coven activity, including a special trunk that was dedicated to the enthronement ceremony in 1963, which Slattery and Wagdilla still don't know what it is yet. And um, and then on 422, you get a you get the Cardinal of Century City confronting Slattery because he knows that he's been poking around at all of the different areas where the uh, where the covens are, and we get this at the end. Slattery held up one hand. Don't leave, Your Excellency, because he wasn't, because uh, they were kind of peppering Slattery with questions, and he wasn't answering. He was just looking at him, and they were getting very uncomfortable with Slattery. After a long science, a silence, Damien's voice seemed to startle both men, making them cringe as if a whip had cracked over their heads. Slattery looked down from his enormous height at the cardinal trapped in his chair. Your Eminence, his word... His words might have come from a giant avenging angel delivering a personal promise of justice. You have but a short time in which to repent. Just, dude, I was like, dude, this is just getting... I love it. I love this guy. Yeah, yeah. 
love this guy, man. It's so Amazing. awesome. Okay, well, quickly, uh, uh, and then I just want to get through what I have, and then we'll see whatever else has. Um, then we have this capstone character. It's one of the last thing notes I have. The capstone character gets in touch. He reminds the members of the Council of Thirteen once again that the availing time capitalized won't last forever, and uh, and then it finishes with Apple Yard trying to figure out how to keep the current powers balanced. We get we get this very interesting Masonic prayer that he shares with the the the, the readers. Uh, yeah. He continues to wonder why the Pope is speaking like a full-on globalist. And then we're shown how highly prioritized population control is for the American government in particular. But no plots of mass murder per se, just plans to introduce contraception and abortion to the third world, etc., all that. But um, overall, the action was really page-turning for these uh, for me. And, um, and yeah, I want to get into this thread here, unless you have any particular notes you want to jump to, Tim. No, let, let's go for it. Uh, just this guy is. Uh, I just found who who the uh, the recently deceased guy was. He he died in 1993. Russiton on my little character key here, and I don't know much. Bishop Leo James Russiton is Bishop John Russell, really deceased in 1993, right before he wrote this book. That's the where they they got all the information there. So, okay. Yep. Well, all right. Um, and he, he was one of the OGs that was there in 63. All right. Um, here we go from Sharon Roth on, on the thread. It says, Frank, starting on page 410, the conversation that Christian has with Bishop James McGregor. We're talking about this now. Bishop McGregor explains the corruption and the changes in the Catholic Church. McGregor says that the, the, uh, the boulderized of the so-called American Church, the flesh has been made word. And the word is digital. He talks about all the paperwork, the committees, the reports, and of course all these words here. These these uh, the single word digital is like one of those computer viruses traveling around the world like lightning. Only this virus is wiping out the whole vocabulary of faith. McGregor talks to Christian about the watchwords. Yes, yes. Um, and on four twelve, McGregor speaks to Christian, telling him that quote after all is said and done. Once all the layers of toughness and richness and subtlety encompassed in God's revelations are stripped to the bones by zeros and ones of the new digital mindset, he talks to Christian about how angels and saints are downright embarrassing. We did that too. Well, I'm glad that everybody's noticing the same thing. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad. Um, at C uh, CM Axon says, I'm glo so glad you wrote this. I started this whole long thing about pages 410 to 412, and I knew it would take up a lot of time to read it on air. It sounds like you nailed it exactly what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, I, that, that chapter right there with Christian Gladstone and this Bishop McGregor, it didn't have the, the action of what you had with Damien Slattery and the detective hitting the road and really just, you know, cracking skulls, looking for demons. Um, but it, w it it was so important because it it's it just such an important diagnosis of what we're living through. And at that time, you know, some people would be like, oh, well, me, I don't know, that's a little bit slippery slope there, Malachi, because it's 1996. As you said, we were all just getting those first, you know, 30 minutes. We're buying those 30 minutes of online time with AOL for 9.99 a month, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, we didn't know where it was all going to go. Um, okay, Gardenia B says, wow, what a tough read this week. Heavy read. For some reason, in the middle of Chapter 37, when following the journey of Father Slattery and Sylvester Wagdilla, tracing the three covens in the Mother Coven, I had flashes of the recent mass killing in Texas. I know that they're different, but I got chills and couldn't help but wonder if such tragedies over the past years are similar satanic, organized, mind control madness. I keep noting through our reading that the characters are puzzled or perturbed as to the Slavic Pope's policies and motivations. However, I believe that Father Aldo Carnesecca is on target when he considers three possibilities of the Pope's actions. Last being that the Pope, quote, considered the whole present structure of the church to be expendable and expected to be replaced by a yet unknown structure. That he didn't want to bring out the old, he didn't want to bring the old structure back, and it followed that his basic idea was to insist on the essentials of morality while he waited upon events. Um, yet Karnaseka re regards that as a mistake, but I think that the Pope is in agreement with the energy 
of the times compelling the church undergo transformation, and I believe he holds a higher view as to how it should unfold. I'm interested in learning more about the Slavic Pope's subtle leadership, perhaps revealing divine guidance. Yeah, we, we should get that. Yeah. Um, and he says, oh, also, I want to add that Herr Otto Secular, a character we have met now and then in this book, reminds me of Yuval Noah Harari of our current day. Yeah, he's a complete butcher. The um, the guy that, that pals around with the World Economic Forum talking about transhumanism as the future. Yeah. Because we we learned that secular is an abortionist, and he, he comes up with new technology for grinding fetal parts down to a more easily drainable sludge, and it's it's he's, he's a he's a sick fuck like the rest of them. What else do we have here? Furry Merman says we see the playbook beginning to seriously unfold as the new world order continues its march toward control. One of the most interesting sections for me was when Damien and Wogdilla come face to face with Father Avanador. The man clearly has a deep, dark, checkered past, but also apparently could be the linchpin to following Damien Slattery to really sink his teeth into his investigation. Addition, when asking about the Mother Chapel, a spirit seems to come out of Avanador's personality, possibly foreshadowing a possible exorcism that many readers and Frank have been hoping for. Oh, I, I, I'm hoping for fallout war. I want the uh, the equivalent of a firefight. Uh, I don't know this. Could, I I love these characters and I I just love the the confidence. They just know it's I'm, all. I'm or worried about Slattery. I mean, because he, he's know. he's directly confronting. He's very directly confronting, and that's not uh that's not what you do to Cardinal Leonardine. So I'm I'm worried about his safety more than uh, Christian Glad's. I think Wagdilla is going to die. I yeah. think I think that they're going to they're going to get rid because they've already spoken. I think it was Capstone had called Channing or Capstone had called the the bishop the uh, cardinal of Century City a few the few a few chapters ago when they were talking about that that conference of bishops in the United States with all of the the witch the female witches there and stuff. It was after that conference that he said he got a call from the Capstone saying, "Why the hell are the U.S. bishops dragging their feet? We got to move this along." And I think one of the the loose ends he inquired about was this detective. So you kind of, kind of, you kind of think that they're trying to right now get rid of Carnesecca and Wagdilla. They want to get rid of the detective Sylvester. But I mean, the Cardinal of Century City is flat out frightened of Damian Slattery right now. Yeah, he's he's yeah. frightened of him. Yeah. Um. And then, and then of course it, it ends with the Pope being in in the hospital. We don't know how he, well, obviously we know he survives, but uh, a lot of people are wondering, what does this mean? And they're, they're trying to think of who could be a replacement if this is the end of the Slavic Pope. <coughs> yeah. 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 Um, one last thing here I have from at CMAXON. Uh, so the biggest thing I take away from this book that we can apply to the current state of a war is this. In our side of the fight, we talk a lot about the coded outward-facing moves being made by the bad guys. We've studied that part and exposed it ad nauseum. But this book gives us a, particularly, a particular perspective and confirms what we think is going on behind the closed doors. It gives us a glimpse into exactly what they talk about when they think no one is listening, and the perspective gives me a little bit more reason to respect, not fear, the true nature of the cabal. They're not idiots. How could they be? But it makes it even more clear why they would put idiots like Biden and Kamala and AOC <coughs> out there. Furthermore, it gives me more hope for the current status of this war, and here's why. The reading... Uh, the reading shows just how meticulous, cautious, and subtle they had to be about everything in order for their plans to, su to succeed. Such care was taken to ensure that they wouldn't be found out. They knew exactly how to pace their moves so that people in large, at large wouldn't reject their agenda. If you look at the pace of things now, they're out of time for caution, and their abandoned subtlety, they're, they are scrambling. They're making mistakes and being discovered left and right. They built their kingdom on shifting sands, and weighing of their lies means that by the laws of nature, let alone the laws of Almighty God, their world will inevitably come crashing down. And it is. That is what it looks like. God wins. Hmm. Yeah, I remember what, what Slattery tells um, when he's kind of giving him a, a godfather-like slap and saying you can... You can 
be a man. That's what you can do. He he's kind of slaps um, Christian earlier. He's like, look, in, in, in God's time, we already know the ending. God wins. But in our time, we know we're losing. Uh, yes. You know, what? don't worry about Karnaseka, he tells him. He's definitely in the fight. Are you in the fight? So he's like, chop, chop. We, we got to go, you know? Yeah, I love it. And, and, and you know, it, it brings me back to page three. Page three. Who? Which which pope is this? I forget. Um, this is the John twenty three fifty seven. It's from nineteen fifty seven. John. Yeah, that would be Pius the twelfth. Pius. Pius. And at the end, um, the Europe, their Europe will go far and it will go fast. But the greater day for Europe has not yet dawned. The Jesuit failed his uh, his his sidekick. Failed to follow the papal vision. Which Europe, Holiness, the, the greatest day for whose Europe? For the Europe that was born today. The Pope's answer was unhesitating. On the day this Holy See is harnessed to the new Europe and the diplomats and politicians to the Europe centered in Brussels and Paris, on that day the Church's misfortunes will start in earnest. Then wow. turning again to watch the limousines departing across from St. Peter's Squ Square, the Pope says to, to finish off the segment, the new Europe will have its little day, Father, but only a day. And I, I right from that, that point on page three, I said, we're, I'm going to be given chills throughout this whole book, aren't I? And, um, and oh, damn, I just, I just had something I wanted to tie to that in particular, but only a day. Oh, it brings us to what we just said before. Uh, this was breaking news this week. You got in touch with me to say that the Scalabrinian missionaries superior general at davos says that the church is at the forefront of implementing the world economic forum agenda so the vatican has admitted that they are working in concert with davos they are there they are an active participant not just a distant observer and maybe a clandestine participant so talk about the new europe i mean right. this is it it we are it's we're standing at it we're up to our knees in this shit <laughs> Yeah, man. Unbelievable how all you have to do is look at the big five events of the last six weeks, five weeks, a big event in a week, you know, from, from the roast uh, Dobbs versus Jackson women's health to Nancy Pelosi being denied the Eucharist to the Vatican uh, openly admitting Info Vaticana, which I, I used to read really regularly, is openly admitting in Italian language that the Vatican's part of the WEF uh, Davos meeting. And uh, there, there's a couple other things that I'm like, oh, man, this is just if Malachi Martin hadn't been killed or whatever, oh, God. he would be saying, see, I told you so. Can you imagine? Just, can you imagine if you and I had two hours with Malachi Martin? Like if we were if by some miracle, if there was a or if we had some sort of a time machine, we can bring him to 2021. Let's say we go back to 1997. Like, you, please, we convince him. Come back with us for a couple hours and let's do some radio and what I could you, what I, you know what I should do I, I'm friends with um, someone that was a friend of his in New York uh, George Coulomb the great great Catholic author he was telling me he used to have dinner with him like once a week he was telling me some Martin stories I'll try to get him on for like our last group if oh, you want me to please and to tell us some, he, uh, he's I mean George Coulomb is based and knows everyone legendary and is a legend himself i'll see if he'll come on with us um he, he he was telling me some amazing martin lore well see if you can do that and ask him if he knows how to get in touch with ralph sarchi okay this guy his name is ralph sarchi he's, he's not a priest but he he was a new york city police department uh sergeant but along the way i mean he became very he reinvested himself in his catholic faith and he became very involved in exorcisms and he became very close friends with Malachi Martin. I think he I think that Ralph Sarchi still lives around here, but that is I would love to talk to Ralph Sarchi. Uh, I would love to talk to anybody that knew Malachi Martin because I, I, obviously they're they're interested in, in in their own I would love to learn about your friend here just him. But um yeah. All right, well, listen, All that's right. what we got for tonight. I have I well here's what I was thinking. We we're on page 439. Let's go to page 479. So just about 50 pages. 439 to the beginning of chapter, what is that, uh, 42? 479. 
So 439 to 479. Let's do it. And um, and Timothy, if that's all, man, I want to thank you again for coming on. This is a night, tight, nice, tight hour. Again, congratulations to you and the wife on the new addition to the family. And and I can't wait for next week. Me too. And I, but thanks, thanks again, Craig. I will be uh, caught up all the way next week after the... the you got the an birth. excuse. Don't worry about it. Yeah. TimothyJGordon.com. Right. Go and subscribe to him on, on YouTube. Put the, the notifications on. He goes live to do breaking news of everything that I think that you guys and gals would be very interested in and uh, become a patron and, and all that stuff. This has been a pleasure, Tim. Thanks again. Thanks, Frank. We'll talk to you soon, bud. All right. Good night, everybody. This was a wonderful week. I will be back on tomorrow night at 10 o'clock to do a little bit of uh, some fun things and, and whatnot. I have some a lot of leftovers from last night that will do just fine for tomorrow. Underwater volcanoes that are spewing out mutant sharks. Uh, I, I have so much. I'll see you tomorrow night, 10 o'clock Eastern Time, for a Friday night special edition. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>